This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. SignalWire real-time video technology allows you to create interactive video experiences that were previously impossible. SignalWire gives developers access to broadcast quality, ultra-low latency video for everything from video collaboration tools for film and TV studios and Fortune 500 enterprises to engaging virtual events. They can even assist with one-of-a-kind fully interactive virtual concerts. See why the future of video communication is being built on SignalWire. Their easy-to-deploy APIs and SDKs are available in most popular programming languages. SignalWire is a complete unified platform for integrating video as well as voice and messaging capabilities into any application. Try it today at SignalWire.com and use code SERADIO for $25 in developer credit. Go to SignalWire.com. That's SignalWire.com and use code SERADIO to receive $25 in developer credit today. This is Jeremy Jung for Software Engineering Radio. Today I'm talking to Yusuf Stribni. He's the author of the book Deployment from Scratch, a Fedora contributor, and he previously worked on the developer experience team at Red Hat. Yusuf, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. There are a lot of commercial services for hosting applications these days. One that's been around for quite a while is Heroku, but there's also services like Render and Netlify. Why should a developer learn how to deploy from scratch? And why would a developer choose to self-host an application? I think that as web engineers and backend engineers, we should know a little bit more how we run our own applications that we write. But there's also a business case, right? For a lot of people, this could be saving money on hosting, especially with managed databases that can go high in price very quickly. And for people like me that, apart from daily job, have also some side project, some little project they want to start and maybe turn into a successful startup, you know, but it's at the beginning. So they don't want to spend too much money on it, you know, and I can deploy and serve my little projects from $5 virtual private servers in the cloud. So I think that's another reason to look into it. And business-wise, if you are, let's say, a bigger team and you have the money, of course, you can afford all these services. But then what happened to me when I was leading a startup, we were at some flare and people were coming and asking us, we need to self-host your application. We don't trust the cloud. And then if you want to prepare this environment for them to host your application, then you also need to know how to do it, right? I understand completely get the point of not knowing it because already backend development can be huge. You know, you can learn so many different databases, languages, whatever, and learning also operations and servers. It can be overwhelming. I want to say you don't have to do it all at once. Just, you know, learn a little bit and you can improve as you go. You will not learn everything in the day. So it sounds like the very first reason might be to just have a better understanding of how your applications are are running because even if you are using a service, ultimately that is going to be running on a, a bare machine somewhere or on a virtual machine somewhere. So it could be helpful maybe for just troubleshooting or, or better understanding how your application works. And then there's what you were talking about with some companies want to self-host and just the cost aspect. Yeah, for me, really, the primary reason would be to understand it. Because, you know, when I was starting programming, uh, well, first of there was PHP and I had some shared hosting, just some FTPT, right? And they would host it for me. But it was fine. Then I switched to Ruby on Rails. And at the time, people were struggling with deploying it. And I was, was asking myself, so, okay, so you run Rails S, like for a server, right? It starts in development, but... Can you just do that on the server for your production? You know, can you just real server and is that it? Or is there more to it? Or when people were talking about uh, Linux hardening, I was like, okay, but you know, your Linux distribution have some good defaults, right? So why don't you need some further hardening? What does it mean? 
what to change. So for me, I really wanted to know the reason I wrote this book is that I wanted to like double down on my understanding that I got it right. Yeah, I, I can definitely relate in the sense that I've also used Ruby and Ruby on Rails as well. And there's this huge gap between just learning how to run it in a development environment on your computer versus deploying it onto a server. And it's pretty overwhelming. So I think it's really great that you're putting together a book that that really goes into a lot of these things that I think that usually aren't talked about when people are just talking about learning a language. You can imagine there are really a lot of components you can have into these applications, right? You have one database, maybe you have more databases, maybe you have a Redis key value store, then you might have load balancers and all that jazz. And I just want to say that there's one thing I also say in the book, like try to keep it simple. If you can just deploy in one server, if you don't need to fulfill some SLE uptime, just do the simplest thing first, because you will really understand it. And when there was an error, you will know how to fix it. Because when you make things complex for you, then it will be kind of lost very quickly. So I try to really make things as simple as possible to stay on top of them. I think one of the first decisions you have to make when you're going to self-host an application is you have to decide which distribution you're going to use. And there's things like Red Hat and Ubuntu and Debian, all these different distributions. And I'm, I'm wondering... For somebody who just wants to deploy their application, whether that's Rails, Django, or anything else, what are the key differences between them and how should they choose a distribution? If you already know one particular distribution, there's no need to constantly be on the hunt for a more shiny thing. You know, more important that you know it well and you are not lost. That said, there are differences, you know, and there could be a long list from goals and philosophy to who makes it, whether community or company, if it's rolling distribution or not, land of support, especially for security updates, the kind of init systems that is used, the kind of C library that is used, packaging format, package manager, and for what I think most people will care about, number of packages and their quality or version. Right, because essentially Linux distribution is distribution of software. So you care about that software. If you are putting your own stuff on top of it, you maybe don't care. You just care about it being a Linux distribution and that's it, that's fine. But if you are using more things from the distribution, you might start caring a little bit more. You know, Other thing is maybe a support for some mandatory access control or in the you know world of Docker, maybe the most minimal image you can get and start with because you will be building a lot of, lot of times the Docker image from the Docker file. And I would say there are two main family of systems that people probably know. One's based on Fedora and those based on Debian, right? From Fedora, you have uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux and OS, now Rocky Linux. And on the Debian side, you have Ubuntu, which is maybe the most popular cloud distribution right now. And of course, as a Fedora packager, I'm kind of in the Fedora world, right? But if I can mention two things that I think make sense or like our advantage to Fedora based systems, then I would say one is modular packages because these traditional systems for a long time offer only one version of particular component, like let's say PostgreSQL or Ruby for one big version. So that means either it worked for you or it didn't. You know, with databases, maybe you could make it work. With Ruby and Python versions, usually you start looking at some version manager to compile your own version because the version was old or, you know, simply not the same the one your application uses. And with modular packages, this changed. And now in Fedora and RHEL and all this, we now have several options to install. There are like four different versions of PostgreSQL, for instance, you know, for different versions of uh, Redis, but also different versions of Ruby and Python. Of course, still you don't get all of the versions you want. So for some people, it still might not work, but I think it's a big step forward. Because even when I was working at Red Hat, we were working on a product called Software Collections. 
this was kind of trying to solve this thing for enterprise customers, but I don't think it was particularly good solution. So I'm quite happy about this modularity effort, you know, and I think the modular packages I look into them recently are, are very better. But I will say one thing, don't expect to use them in a way you use your regular version manager for development. So if you want to be switching between versions of different projects, that's not the use case for them, at least as I understand it, not for now, you know, but for server, that's fine. And the second good advantage of a federal based system, I think, is good initial SE Linux profile settings. You know, SE Linux is security enhanced Linux. What it really is, is a mandatory access control. So on the usual distribution, you have a discrete permissions that you set that users send themselves on their directories and files, you know, but this mandatory access control means that it's kind of a profile that is there beforehand that the administrators prepares and it's kind of orthogonal to those other security boundaries you have there. So that will help you to protect your most vulnerable processes because especially with SE Linux, there are several modes. So there is a, uh, MLM mode for like that maybe an army would use, you know, but for what we use, what's like the default, it's uh, something called targeted policy. And that means you are targeting the vulnerable processes. So that means your services that you are exposing to external work, like whether it's SSH, PostgreSQL, Nginx, all those things. So you have a special profile for them. And if someone, some attacker, takes over of your one component, one process, they still cannot do much more than what the component was kind of prepared to do. I think it's really good that we have these high quality settings already made because other distributions, they might actually be able to run with SE Linux, but they don't necessarily provide you any starting points. You would have to do all your policies yourself. And SE Linux is actually quite a complex system. You know, it's difficult. It's even... It's even difficult to use it as a user, kind of. If you see some tutorials for SendOS, you will see a lot of people mentioning Selenos, maybe even turning it off. There's this struggle, you know? And that's why I also use and write like one big chapter on SE Linux to get people more familiar and less scared about using it and running with it. So SE Linux is, it sounds like it's basically something where you have these different profiles for different types of applications. You mentioned SSH, for example, maybe there could be one for Nginx or, or one for Postgres. And they're basically these collections of permissions that a process should be able to have access to, whether that's network ports or file system permissions, things like that. And they're kind of all prepackaged for you. So you're saying that if you are using a Fedora-based distribution, you could say that I want SSH to be allowed, so I'm going to turn on this profile, or I want Nginx to be used on this system, so I'm going to turn on this profile. And those permissions are just going to be applied to the process that needs it. Is that correct? Well, actually, in the base system, there will be already a set of base settings that are loaded you know, and you can make your own policy models that you can load. But essentially it works in a way that what's not really permitted and allowed is disallowed. That's why it can be a pain in the ass. And as you said, you are completely correct. You can imagine it as an Nginx, as a reverse proxy communicating with Puma application server via a Unix socket, right? And now Nginx will need to have access to that socket to be even being able to write to a Unix socket and so on. So things like that. But luckily you don't have to know all these things because it's really difficult, especially if you're starting out. So there are a set of tools and utilities that will help you to use Selenux in a very convenient way. So what you do, what I would suggest you to do is to run as in Linux in a permissive mode, which means that it locks any kind of violations that the application does against your base system policies, right? So you will have them in the lock, but everything will work. Your application will work, so you don't have to worry about it. And after some time of running your application, you will run these utilities to analyze 
these logs and these violations. And they can even generate a profile for you. So you will know, okay, this is the profile I need. This is the extra settings I need to add. Once after you do that, if there will be some problem with your process, if some attacker will try to do something else, they will be denied that action. It will simply not happen. Yeah. But because of these utilities, you can kind of almost automate how you make your profile. And that way it's much easier. So basically the operating system, it comes with all these defaults of things that you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. You turn on this permissive flag and it logs all the things that it, it would have blocked if you were enforcing SE Linux. And then you can basically go in and add the things that are that are missing. Yes, exactly right. The next thing I'd like to go into is one of the things you talk about in the book is about how your services, your application, how it runs as daemons. And I wonder if you could define what a daemon is. Uh, you can think about them as a background process, you know, something that continuously runs in the background. Even if the virtual machine goes down and you reboot, you just want them again to be restarted and just run at all times the system is running. And for things like an application you write or for a database, should the application itself know how to run itself in the background? Or is that the responsibility of some operating system level process manager? Every Linux operating system have actually a so-called init system. It's actually the second process after the Linux kernel that started on your system. It has a process ID of one, and it's essentially the parent of all your processes because on Linux, you have always parents and children because you, are, you use forking to make new processes. And so this is your system process manager. But obviously, with system D, if it's your system process manager, you already trust it with all the system services. You can also trust it with your application, right? I mean, who else would you trust? Even if you choose some other process manager, because there are many, essentially you would have to wrap that process manager being a systemd service, because otherwise you wouldn't have this connection of systemd being supreme supervisor of your application, right? When uh, one of your services trouble, you want it to be restarted and continue. So that's what... Uh, System D could do for you if you kind of design everything as a system D service. For base packages like base PostgreSQL, they will already come with a system D service, so it's very easy to use. You just simply start it and it's running, you know? And then for your application, you would write system D service, which is a little file. There are some directives. It's kind of very simple and straightforward because before, before system D, People were using the services with Bash, and it was kind of error prone. But now with systemd, it's it's quite simple. They are just a set of directives that you learn. You tell systemd, you know, under what user you should run, or what working directory uh, you want it to be running with. Is there an environment file? Is there a pit file? And then a uh, few other things. The most important being a directive called exec start which tells system D what process to start. It will start a process and it will simply oversee, it will log errors and so on. So in the past, I know there used to be applications that were written where the application itself would background itself. And basically that would allow you to run it in the background without something like a system D. And so it sounds like now what you should do instead is have your application be built to just run in the foreground and your process manager like system D can be configured to handle restarting it, which user is running it, environment variables, all sorts of different things that in the past you might have had to write in your own bash script or write into the application itself. And there's also some other niceties about system D because for example, you can define how reloading should work. So for instance, if you just change some configuration and you want to achieve some kind of zero downtime change, zero downtime deploy, you know, you can tell system D how this could be achieved with your process. And if it cannot be achieved, because for instance, 
Kuma application server, it can fork processes and it can actually, it can restart those processes in a way that it will be zero downtime. But when you want to change the whole Puma process, so what do you do, right? And systemd have this nice thing called socket activation. And with systemd socket activation, you can make another unit. It's not a service unit, it's a socket unit, because there are many kinds of units in systemd. And you would basically make a socket unit that would listen to those connections and then pass them to the application. So while application is just starting, and then it could be a completely normal restart, which means stopping and starting, then it will keep the connections open, keep the sockets open, and then pass them when uh, the application is ready to process them. So it sounds like in these sockets you're referring to, these would be TCP sockets, for example, of someone trying to access a website? Yes, but actually it works with Unix socket as well. So in that example... Let's say a user is trying to go to a website and your service is currently down. You can actually configure system D to let the user connect and wait for another application to come back up and then hand that connection off to the application once it's back up. Yes, exactly that. Yeah. You're basically able to remove some of the complexity out of the applications themselves for some of these special cases and offload those to system D. Because yeah, otherwise you would actually need a second server, right? You would have to start second server, move traffic there, then upgrade or update your first server and exchange them back. And system D socket activation, you can avoid doing that and still have this final effect of zero downtime deployment. So this introduction of system D as the process manager, I think this happened a few years ago where a lot of Linux distributions moved to using system D. And there was some, I suppose, controversy around that. And I'm kind of wondering if you have any perspective on why there's some people who really didn't want that to happen, you know, why that's something people should worry about or not? Yeah, there were, I think there were a few things. One was, for instance, the system logging that suddenly became a binary format and you need a special utility to read it, you know? I mean, it's more efficient. It's in a way better, but it's not plain text, which all administrators preferred or were used to. So I understand the concern, you know, but it's kind of like, it's fine. You know, at least to me, it's fine. And the second thing that people, when systemd force some kind of system creep, because uh, systemd is trying to do more and more every year. <laughs> so some people say it's not the Unix way. Systemd should be very minimal in its system and not do anything else. It's partially true, but at the same time, the things that systemd went into, you know, I think they are essentially easier and nice to use. At least with the systemd services, I can say I, I certainly prefer how it's done now. Yeah, so it sounds like we've been talking about systemd as being this process manager when the operating system first boots, systemd starts, and then it's responsible for starting your applications or other applications running on the same machine. But then it's also doing all sorts of other things, like you talked about that socket activation use case. There's logging I think there's also scheduled jobs. There's like all sorts of other things that are a part of system D. And that's where some people disagree on whether it should be one application that's handling all these things. Yeah. Yeah. You're right with the scheduling job, like replacing cron. You have now two ways how to do it, but you can still pretty much choose what you use. I mean, I still use cron, so I don't see a, a trouble there. We'll see how it goes. One of the things I remember I struggled with a little bit when I was learning to deploy applications was when you're working locally on your development machine, you have to install a language runtime in a lot of cases, whether that's for Ruby or Python, Java, anything like that. And when someone is installing on their own machine, they often use something like a version manager. Like, for example, for Ruby, there's RBMV, and for 
Node, for example. There's NVM. There's all sorts of ways of installing language runtimes and managing the versions. How should someone set up their language runtime on a server? Like, would they use the same tools they use on their development machine, or is it something? Yeah. So there are several ways you can do. As I mentioned before, with the modular packages, if you find the version there, I would actually recommend to try to do it with the model package because the thing is, it's so easy to install, you know, and it's kind of instant. It takes no time on your server. It, you just install it as a regular package. Same is true when building a Docker image because, again, it will be really fast. So if you can use it, I would just use that because it's like kind of convenient. But a lot of people will use some kind of version manager, you know, technically speaking, they can only use the installer part. Like for instance, Truby use Ruby install to install new versions, right? But then you would have to reference these full paths to your Ruby and where it is. So what I personally do, I just really set it up as if I'm on a developer workstation. Because for me, the mental model of that is very simple. I use the same thing, you know, and this is true. For instance, when then you are referencing what to start in this exec start directive in system D, you know, because you have several choices. For instance, if you need to start Puma, you could be, you could be referencing the address that is like in your user home, dot gem, Ruby version number, bin Puma. Or you can use this version manager. They might have something like Ruby dash exec uh, to run with the right version of Ruby. And then you pass it the actual Puma, Puma part and it will start for you. But what you can also do, and I think it's kind of beautiful. You can do it is that you can just start bash uh, with a login shell. And then you just give it the bundle exec Puma command that you would use normally after logging. Because if you install everything normally, you know, you have something, you know, bash profile that will load that environment that will put the right version of Ruby and suddenly it works. And I find it nice because even when you are later logging in to your box, you log in as that user, as that application user, and suddenly you have all that environment then and just can start things as you are used to, you know, no problem there. Yeah, something I've run into the past is when I would install a language runtime and like you were kind of describing, I would have to type in the full path to get to the Ruby runtime or or the Python runtime. And it sounds like what you're saying is just install it like you would on your development machine and then in the systemd configuration file you actually log into a bash shell and, and run your application from the bash shell. So it has access to the, all the same things you would have in an interactive login environment. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. So it will be basically the same thing and it's kind of easy to reason about it. You know, like you can start with that. Maybe you will change it later to something else, but it's a nice way how to do it. So you, you mentioned having a user to run your application. And so I'm wondering how you decide what Linux user should run your applications. Are you creating a separate user for each application you run? Like, how are you making those decisions? Yes, I am actually making a new user for for my application. Well, at least for the part of application that is the application server and workers, you know, so Nginx and might have its own user, PostgreSQL might have its own user, you know, I'm not like trying to consolidate that under one user, but in terms of REST application, like whenever I run Puma or whenever I run Sidekick, that will be part of that one user, you know, application user, and I will appropriately set the rights exercise directories, so it's isolated from everything else. And something that I've seen also when you are installing Ruby or you're installing some other language runtime, you have the libraries, like in the case of Ruby, there's gems. And when you're on your development machine and you install these gems, these packages, they go into the user's home directory. And so you're able to install and use them without 
having, let's say, pseudo or root access. Is that something that you carry over to your deployments as well? Or do you store your your libraries and your gems in some place that's accessible outside of that user? I'm just wondering how you approach that. I would actually keep it next to my application. This kind of touches maybe the question or where to put your application files on the system. So there is something called FHS, File System Hierarchy Standard, you know, that Linux distributions use. They, of course, use it with some little modifications here and there. And this standard is basically followed by packagers and enforced in package review process. But other than that, it's kind of random, you know, it could be a different path. And it says where certain files should go. So you have slash home, you have slash user bin for executables, L slash var for logs, and so on and so on. And now when you want to put your your application file somewhere, you are thinking where to put them, right? You have essentially, I think, like three options. For one, you can put it to home because as we talked about, I set up a dedicated user for that application. So it could make sense to put it in home. Why I don't like putting it at home is because there are certain labeling in SE Linux that kind of makes your life more difficult. It's not meant to be there, essentially. On some other system uh, without SE Linux, I think it works quite fine. I also did it before, you know, it's not like you cannot do it, you can. Then you have the kind of your web server default locations, you know, like user share, nginx html or slash var slash www and these systems will be prepared for you with all these se linux labeling so when you put files there well things were mostly work but i also saw a lot of people do that because this particular reason what i don't like about it is that if nginx is just my reverse proxy you know it's not that i am serving the files from there so I don't like the location for this reason. If it would be just static website, I would absolutely put it there. That's the best location. Then you can put it to some arbitrary location, some new one that's not conflicting with anything else. You know, If you want to follow the call system hierarchy standard, you would put it to slash SRV, you know, and then maybe slash name of the application or your domain name, host name. You can choose what you like. So that's what I do now. I simply do it from scratch to this location and as part of the SE Linux, I simply make a module, make a profile and allow all these paths to work. And so to answer your question where I would put these gems, it would actually go to this directory. It would be like slash app slash gems, for instance. There's a few different places people could put their application. They could put it in the user's home folder, but you were saying because of the built-in SE Linux rules, SE Linux is going to basically fight you on that and prevent you from doing a lot of things in that folder. What you've chosen to do is to create your own folder that I guess you described it as being somewhat arbitrary, just being a folder that you consistently are going to use in all your projects. And then you're going to configure SE Linux to allow you to run whatever you want to run from this custom folder that you've decided. Yeah, you can say that you do almost the same amount of work for home or some other location, but I simply find it cleaner to do it this way. And in a way, even fulfill the FIHS uh, suggestion to put it to slash SRV. But uh, yeah, it's completely arbitrary. You can choose anything else. Uh, Sysadmins choose www or whatever they like, and it's fine. It will work. There's no problem there. And for the gems, actually they could be in home, you know, but I just instruct bundler to put it to that location uh, next to my application. Okay. Rather than having a common folder for multiple applications to pull your libraries or your gems from, you have it installed in the same place as the application. And that just keeps all your dependencies in the same place. Yeah. And the example you're giving, you're putting everything in slash SRV slash, and then maybe the name of your application. Yes. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I've noticed that just looking at different 
systems. I've seen people install things into slash OPT, installed into slash SRV, and it can just be kind of tricky as somebody who's starting out to know where am I supposed to put this stuff. So, so basically, it sounds like just pick a place and at least if it's in slash SRV, then sysadmins who are familiar with the standard file system hierarchy will know to look in there. Yeah, yeah. OPT is also a yeah, common location, as you say. Or, you know, if it's actually a packaged web application, if you the right, can even be in slash user slash share, you know, so it might not be necessarily in the locations we talked about before. SE Radio listeners, we want to hear from you. Please visit se-radio.net slash survey to share a little information about your professional interests and listening habits. It takes less than two minutes to help us continue to make SE Radio even better. Your responses to the survey are completely confidential. That's se-radio.net slash survey. Thanks for your support of the show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. One of the things you cover in the book is setting up a deployment system and you're using shell scripts in the case of the book. And I was wondering how you decide when shell scripts are sufficient and when you should consider more specialized tools like Ansible or Chef, Puppet, things like that. Yeah, I chose Bash in the book because you get to see things without abstractions. You know, if I would be using, let's say, Ansible, then suddenly we are writing some YAML files and you are using a lot of Python modules that Ansible use and you don't really know what's going on at all times. So you learn to do things with Ansible 2.0, let's say, Mm -hmm. and then new Ansible comes out and you have to relearn what you did, you know, and I would have to rewrite the book. But the thing is that with just bash, I can show literally just bash commands like, okay, you run this and this happens. And another thing why I use it is that you realize how simple something can be. Like you can have a super cool cluster with SSH and whatever in maybe 20 bash commands around that. So it's not necessarily that difficult and it's much easier to actually understand it if it's just those 20 bash commands. I also think that learning a little bit more about bash is actually quite beneficial because you encounter them in various of places. I mean, RPM spec files, like the packages are built, that's bash, you know. Language version managers like PyEnv, RBM, that's bash. If you want to tweak it, if you have a bug there, you might look into source code and try to fix it, you know, it will be bash. Then Docker files are essentially bash, you know, their entry point skills might be bash. So it's not like you can really avoid bash. So maybe learning a little bit, just a little bit more than you know, and be a little bit more comfortable, I think it can get you a long way because even I am not a, some bash programmer, you know, I would never call myself like that. Also consider this like you can have a full feature Rails application, maybe in 200 lines of bash code up and running somewhere. You can understand it in the afternoon. So for a small deployment, I think it's quite refreshing to use bash and some people miss out on not just doing the first simple thing possible that they can do. But obviously, when you go like more team members, more complex applications, or a suite of applications, things get difficult very fast with Bash. So obviously, most people will end up with some higher level tool. It can be Ansible. It can be Chef. It might be Kubernetes, you know. So my philosophy, again, is just to keep it simple. If I can do something with Bash and it's like 100 lines, I will do this bash because when I come back to it, even after three years, it will work and I can directly see what I have to fix. You know, if there's a PostgreSQL update at this new location, whatever, I immediately know where to look and what to change. And with high level tooling, you kind of have to stay on top of them, uh, the new versions and updates. So that's that bash is very limited, but it's kind of refreshing for very small deployment you want to do for your side project. Yeah, so it sounds like from a learning perspective, it's beneficial because you can see line by line and it's code you wrote and you know exactly what each thing does. But also it, it sounds like when you have a project that's relatively small, maybe there there aren't a lot of different servers or 
the deployment process isn't too complicated, you actually choose to start with Bash and then only move to something more complicated like Ansible or, or even Kubernetes once your project has gotten to a certain size. You would see it in the book. I even explain a multiple server deployment using Bash where you can actually keep your components like kind of separate. So like your database have its own lifecycle, have its own deploy script, then your load balancer, the same. And then even when you have application servers, maybe you have more of them. So the nice thing is that when you first write your first script to provision one server, configure one server, then you simply write another supervising script that would call this single script just in a loop and you would change the server variable to change the IP address or something. And suddenly you can deploy to more. Of course, it's very basic and it's, uh, you know, it doesn't have some any kind of parallelization to it or whatever. But if you have like free application servers, you can do it and you understand it almost immediately. You know, if you are already a software engineer, there's almost nothing to understand and you can just start and keep going. And when you're deploying to servers, a lot of times you're dealing with credentials, whether that's private keys, passwords, or keys to third-party APIs. And when you're working with this self-hosted environment, working with Bash scripts, I was wondering what you use to store your credentials and how those are managed. I use a desktop application called Password Safe that can save my passwords and whatever. And you can also put their SSH keys and so on. And then I simply can do a backup of these keys and of these passwords to some other secure physical location. But basically, I don't use any service online for that. I mean, there are services for that, especially for Teams and in cloud, especially the big cloud, they might have their own services for that. But for me personally, Again, I just keep it as simple as I can. It's just on my my computer, maybe my hard disk, and that's it. It's nowhere else. So would this be a case of where on your local machine, for example, you might have a file that defines all the environment variables for each server. You don't check that into your source code repository, but when you run your bash scripts, maybe you read from that file and use that in deploying to the server? Generally speaking, yes, but I think with Rails, there's a nice option to use their encrypted credentials. So basically then you can commit all these secrets together with your app. And the only thing you need to keep to yourself is just like one variable. So it's much more easy to store it and keep it safe because it's just like one thing and everything else you keep inside your repository. I know for sure there are other programs that behave in the same way that can be used with different stacks that doesn't have this baked in because Rails have it baked in. But if you are using Django, if you are using Elixir, whatever, then they don't have it. But I know that there are some programs, I don't remember their names right now, but they essentially allow you to do exactly the same thing, to just commit it to the source control, but in a secure way because it's encrypted. Yeah, that's an interesting solution because you always hear about people checking in passwords and keys into their source code repository and then, you know, it gets exposed online somehow. But in this case, like you said, it's encrypted and only your machine has the key. So that actually allows you to use the source code to store all that. Yeah, I think for teams, you know, for more complex deployments, there are various tools from HashiCorp Vault you know, to some cloud providers things, but you can really start and keep it very, very simple. For logging an application that you're self-hosting, there's a lot of different managed services that exist, but I was wondering what you use in a self-hosted environment and whether your applications are logging to standard out, whether they're writing the files themselves. I was wondering how you typically approach yeah, that. So... There are a lot of logs you can have, right? From system log to your web server log, application log, database log, whatever. And you somehow need to stay on top of them because when you have one server, it's quite fine to just log in 
and look around but when there are more servers involved it's kind of a pain and uh, so people start to look in some centralized logging system i think when you are more mature you would look to things like datadoc right or you will build something of your own on elastic stack that's what we do on the project i'm working right now but i kind of think that there's some upfront cost uh setting it all up you know and in terms of some logging with elastic stack you are essentially building your logging application even you can say you know it's a lot of work i also want to say that you don't look into your logs all that often especially if you set up proper error and performance monitoring, which is what I do with my project. It's one of the first thing I do. So those are services like Rollbar and Skylight, and there are some that you can self-host. So if people want to self-host them, they can, but I find it kind of easier to, even though I'm self-hosting my application, to just rely on this hosted solution like Rollbar, Skylight, AppSignal, you know. And I have to say, especially I started to like AppSignal recently because they kind of bundle everything together. When you have trouble with your self-hosting, the last thing you want to find yourself in is a situation when your self-hosted logs and self-hosted error reporting also went down and doesn't work, you know? <laughs> so right, although right. I like self-hosting my application, I kind of like to offload this responsibility to some hosted hosted providers. Yeah, so I think that in and of itself is a interesting topic to cover because we've mostly been talking about self-hosting your applications and you were just saying how logging might be something that's actually better to use a managed service. I was wondering if there's other services, for example, CDNs or other things where it actually makes more sense for you to let somebody else host it rather than yourself? I think that really depends. Logging for me is obvious. And then I think a lot of developers kind of fear databases. So they rather have some kind of one-click database, you know, replication and all that just baked in. So I think a lot of people would go for managed database. Although it's maybe one of those pricey services, it's also like one that actually gives you a lot of peace of mind, you know. Maybe I would just like point out that even though you get all these automatic backups and so on, maybe you should still try to make your own backup just for sure, you know. Even someone promised something, uh, your data is usually the most valuable thing you have in your application, so you should not lose it. And uh, some people will go maybe for load balancers because it's maybe easy to start, like let's say on DigitalOcean, you know, you just click it and it's there. But if you go opposite direction, if you, for instance, decide to self-host your load balancer, it can also give you more options what to do with that, right? Because you can configure it differently. You can even configure it to be a backup server if all of your application servers go down, which is maybe could be interesting use case, right? If you mess up and your application servers are not running because you were just messing with, with them, suddenly it's okay because your load balancer just takes on traffic, right? And you can do that if it's your load balancer. The ones hosted are sometimes limited. So I think it comes to also, even with the databases, you know, it's like maybe you use some kind of extension that is simply not available that kind of makes you self-host something. But if they offer exactly what you want and it's really easy, you know, then maybe you just, you just do it. And that's why I think I kind of like deploying to virtual machines in the cloud because you can mix and match all these services the way you want and can always change the configurations to match your needs. And I find that quite nice. One of the things you talk about near the end of your book is how you start with a single server. You have the, database, the application, the web server, everything on the same machine. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how far you can take that one server and, and why people should consider starting with that approach. It depends a lot on your application. For instance, I write applications that are quite simple in nature. I don't have so many SQL calls in one page and so on. But the applications I worked for before, sometimes they are quite heavy. And, you know, even with little traffic, they suddenly need a more beefy server, you know, so it's, 
a lot about application, but there are certainly a lot of good examples out there. For instance, the team from Xplan Flight Simulator, they just deployed to one one server, you know, the whole backend, all those flying players, because it's essentially simple. And they even use Elixir, which is based on Beam VM, which means it's great for concurrency, for distributed systems. It's great for multiple servers, but they still deploy to one because it's simple. And they use the second only when they do uh, update to the service. And otherwise they go back to one. Another one would be maybe a Peter's level. So it's like maker that already has like $1 million business. And it's, he has all of his projects on one server, you know, because it's enough. Why you need to make it complicated? You can go and a very profitable service and you might not leave one server. It's not a problem. Another good example, I think, is Stack Overflow. They have, I think they have some page where they exactly show you what servers they are running. They have multiple servers, but the thing is they have only a few servers, you know. So those are the examples that goes against maybe that trend of spinning up hundreds of servers in the cloud, which you can do. Maybe it's easier when you have to do auto scaling because you can just go little by little, you know, but I don't see the point of having more servers. To me, it means more work. If I can do it with one, I do it with one. But I would mention one thing to pay attention to when you are on one server. You don't want suddenly your background workers exhaust all the CPU so that your database cannot serve your queries anymore, right? So for that, I recommend looking into control groups or C groups on Linux. When you create a simple slice where you define how much CPU power and how much memory can be used for that service, and then you attach it to to some processes, you know, and when we are talking about system D services, they actually have this one directive where you specify your C group slice. And then when you have this worker server, and maybe it even forks because it, it runs some utilities, right? For you to process images or what's not, then it will be all contained within that C group. So it will not influence the other services you have. And you can say, okay, you know, I give worker service only 20% of my CPU power because I don't care if they make it fast or not. It's not important. Important is that every visitor still gets its page, you know, and if they are working, uh, waiting for some background process, so they will wait and your service is not going down. Yeah, so it, it sort of sounds like the difference between if you have a whole bunch of servers, then you have to have some way of managing all those servers, whether that's Kubernetes or something else. Whereas an alternative to that is having one server or just a few servers, but going a little bit deeper into the capabilities of the operating system, like the C groups you were referring to, where you could specify how much CPU, how much RAM and things for each service on that same machine to use. So it's kind of changing... I don't know if it's removing work, but it's changing the type of work you're doing. Yeah, you essentially maybe have to think about it more in a way with this case of splitting the memory or CPU power. But also it enables you to use, for instance, Unix sockets instead of TCP sockets, and they are faster, you know? So in a way, it can be also an advantage for you in some cases to actually keep it on one server. And of course, you don't have a network trip so another saving. So together that service will be faster as long as it's running and there's no problem, it will be faster. And for high availability, yeah, it's obviously a problem if you have just one server, but you also have to think about it in more complex way. To be high available with all your components from load balancers to databases, you suddenly have a lot of servers, you know, to take care. And that setup might be complex, might be fragile, and maybe you are better off with just one server that you can quickly spin up again. So for instance, there's any problem with your server, you get alert and you simply make a new one, you know? And if you can configure it within a 20, 30 minutes, maybe it's not a problem. Maybe even you are still fulfilling your service level contract for uptime. So I think if I can go this way, I prefer it simply because it's so much easier to think about it like that. <laughs> 
This might be a little difficult to answer, but when you look at the projects where you've self-hosted them versus the projects where you've gone all in on, say, AWS, and when you're trying to troubleshoot a problem, do you find that it's easier when you're troubleshooting things on a VM that you set up? Or do you find it easier to troubleshoot when you're working with something that's connecting a bunch of managed services? Absolutely. I find it much easier to debug anything I set up myself, especially with one server is even easier. But simply the fact that you build it yourself means that you know how it works. And at any time you can go and fix your problem. You know, this is what I found a problem with uh, services like Digital Ocean Marketplace. I don't know how they call this self-hosted apps that you can like one click and have your Rails Django app up and running. I actually used when I wasn't that skilled uh, with Linux and self-hosting, I use a Linux distribution called a Turnkey Linux. It's the same idea, you know, it's like that they prepare a profile for you and then you can just easily run it as if it's a completely hosted thing like Heroku. But actually, it's your server and you have to pay attention. But I actually don't like it because you didn't set it up. You don't know how it's set up. You don't know if it has some problems, some security issues. And especially the people that come for these services, they end up running something and they don't know. I believe they don't know because when I was running it, I didn't know. (laughs) Right? So they are not even know what they are running. So... If you really don't want to care about it, I think it's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But just go for that render or Heroku and make your life easier, you know? Yeah, it sounds like the solutions where it's like a one-click install on your own infrastructure, you get the bad parts of both. Like you get the bad parts of having this machine that you need to manage, but you didn't set it up, so you're not really sure how to manage it. You don't have that team at Amazon who can fix something for you because ultimately it's still your machine. So that could have some issues there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would not recommend it. Or if you really decide to do it, at least really look inside, you know, try to understand it, try to learn it, then it's fine. But just to spin it up and hope for the best, it's not the way to go. In the book, you cover a few different things that you use, such as Ruby on Rails and Nginx, Redis, Postgres. I'm assuming that the things you would choose for applications you build and self-host, you want them to have as little maintenance as possible because you're the one who's responsible for all of it. I'm wondering if there's any other applications that you consider a part of your default stack that you can depend on and that the maintenance burden is is low. Yeah, so that's exactly right. If I can, I would rather minimize the amount of dependencies I have. So for instance, I would think twice of using, let's say Elasticsearch, even though I used it before and it's uh, great for what it can do. If I can avoid it, maybe I would try to avoid it. You know, you can have descent full text search with Postgres today. So as long as it would work, I would personally avoid it. I think one relation database, let's say Redis is kind of necessary, you know. I work a lot with Elixir recently, so we don't use Redis, for instance. So it's quite nice that you can limit uh, limit the number of dependencies by just choosing a different stack. Although then you have to uh, write your application in a little different way. So sometimes even in circumstances, Redis could be useful, you know. I, I think it's not difficult to run it, so I don't see a problem there. I would just say that with the services like Elasticsearch, they might not come with a good authentication option. For instance, I think Elasticsearch offers it, but not in the free version, you know? So I would just like to say that if you are deploying a component like that, be aware of it, that you cannot just keep it completely open to the world, you know? And uh, maybe if you don't want to pay for a version that has it, or maybe you are using a database that doesn't have it completely. You could maybe build a, just a little bit tiny proxy that would just do authentication and pass this request back and forth. That's what you could do. 
you know, but just not forget that you might run something unauthenticated. I was wondering if there is any other applications or capabilities where you would typically hand off to a managed service rather than trying to deal with yourself? Oh, sending emails. Not because it's hard. It's actually surprisingly easy to start sending your own emails. But the problem is the deliverability part, right? You want your emails to be delivered. And I think it's because of the amount of spam everybody's sending. It's very difficult to get into people's boxes. You know, you would simply be flagged. You have some unknown address. It would just not work. So actually building up some history of some IP address, it could take a while. It could be very annoying. And you don't even know how to debug it. You, you cannot really write Google, hey, I'm just like this nice little server, so just consider me. You cannot do that. So I think it's a kind of a travel. So I would say for email, definitely there's another thing that just go with a hosted option. You might still configure your server to be sending up emails that could be useful, for instance, if you want to do some little thing like scanning your system log. And when you see some troublesome logging, you know, that shouldn't happen or something. And maybe you just want an alert, you want email to be sent to you that something fishy is going on. And so you can still set up even your server, not just your main application it might have a nice library for that, you know, to send that email, but you will still need this so-called relay server that will just pass your email further. Yeah. Because building this trust in email world, it's not something I would do. And I don't think as a, you know, independent indie maker developer, you can really have resources to do something like that. So that would be a perfect example for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably a good place to start wrapping up, but is there anything we missed that you think we should have talked about? I think we kind of covered it. Maybe we didn't talk much about containers that a lot of people nowadays use. Maybe I would just like to point out one thing with containers is that you can, again, do just very minimal approach to adopting containers. You know, you don't need to go full on containers at all. You can just run a little service, maybe your workers in a container. For example, if I want to run something as part of my application, the upstream, the developers that develop this one component already provide a Docker file it's very easy way to start, right? Because you just deploy their image and you run it, that's it. And uh, you don't have to learn what kind of different stack it is. Is it Java, is it Python, how I would run it. So maybe you care for your own application, but when you have to just take something that's already made and it has a Docker image, it's just a really nice way to start. And one more thing I would like to mention is that you also don't really need using services like Docker Hub, you know? Well, most people would use it to host their artifacts, their built images, so they can quickly pull them up and uh, start them on many, many servers and blah, blah. But if you have just one server like me, but you want to use containers, a nice thing is to just, you know, push the container directly. You essentially, it's just an archive. In that archive, there are a few folders. They represent the layers. That's the layers you build it in the Docker file. And that's it. You can just move it around like that. And you don't need any external services to run your containerized little service. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point because a lot of times when you hear people talking about containers, it's within the context of Kubernetes and you know that's a whole other thing you have to learn. You have to learn not only how containers work, but you have to learn how to deploy Kubernetes, how to work with that. And I think it's good to remind people that it is possible to just choose a few things, run them as containers. You don't need to, like you said, even run everything as containers. You can just try a few things. Yeah, exactly. Where can people check out the book and where can they follow you and see what you're up to? So they can just go to deploymentfromscratch.com. That's like the homepage for the book. And if they want to follow up, they can find me on Twitter. That would be slash S-T-R-Z-I-B-N-Y-J, like Stazibny J. And I try to post updates there, but also some news from Ruby, Elixir, Linux world. So 
thick and full long. I had a chance to read through the alpha version of the book, and there's a lot of really good information in there. I think it's something that I wish I had had when I was first starting out because there's so much that's not really talked about. Like when you go look online for how to learn Django or how to learn Ruby on Rails or things like that, they teach you how to build the application, how to run it on your laptop. But there's this very large gap between what you're doing on your laptop and what you need to do to get it running on a server. So I think anybody who's interested in learning more about how to deploy their own application or even how it's done in general, I think they'll find the book really valuable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for saying that. It makes me really happy. And as you say, that's the idea. I really packed like kind of everything you need in that book. And I just use Bash so it's easier to follow and uh, keep it without any abstractions. And then maybe you will learn some other tools and you will apply the concepts, but you can do whatever you want. All right. Well, Yusuf, thank you so much for talking to me today. Thank you, Jeremy. This has been Jeremy Jung for Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for listening. SE Radio listeners, we want to hear from you. Please visit se-radio.net slash survey to share a little information about your professional interests and listening habits. It takes less than two minutes to help us continue to make SE Radio even better. Your responses to the survey are completely confidential. That's se-radio.net slash survey. Thanks for your support of the show. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.